This is the Getsy Health Podcast with Janique and Tristan Roney. Hi, guys. Welcome back to the Gutsy Health Podcast. We are very excited and we are fired up today. We have a doozy of an episode and I really think that you're all going to love it. Yes. And so if we do our jobs correctly over the next 45 to 50 minutes, you will feel like you've had a veil lifted from your eyes and you will see and potentially interact with your world very, very differently. So, and and if we're trying to do this in 50 minutes, we better get get going. Okay. You guys, today we're going to be deconstructing culture and social, um, societal norms that are making you sick and keeping you there. In other words, we're going to talk about how your entire world has been designed to make you unwell and to prevent you from getting well. Exactly. So, sit down because we're going to have probably the biggest heart to heart that we've ever had with our audience. Okay. So, are you guys ready? <laughs> Sit down. Do we this. need to talk. All right. Okay. Things are yeah, things are gonna go down, guys. Okay. Now, when we started seeing people in our clinic, we we found answers for them. They're sick. They come to us for answers. We find answers, and they couldn't implement answers. And I couldn't figure out why. So to find out that why, I had to go back to our story. Where Why did we implement these changes in our lives? Why did we make these massive lifestyle changes and interact with our food and our environment completely differently? So um, let's rewind back to when Tristan was originally diagnosed with cancer. My mother-in-law flies in to Texas for two weeks. She raids my pantry, takes out all the junk food, teaches me how to cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner. She basically teaches me how to use vegetables and cook with vegetables again. And it was one of the scariest slash most daunting two weeks of my entire life. And it took a lot of work. It took hours and hours of me practicing and repracticing, but I was handheld through that. And I remember thinking... There's got to be an easier way. And I figured out easier ways. I did. Instead of spending all day in the kitchen, I only spent a couple hours in the kitchen making delicious, healthy meals. Okay. So that was almost three years ago. Fast forward to when our clinic opens and now people are coming in and they're sick and they are desperate and they've spent thousands upon thousands of dollars and they come in and I say, hey, this can be fixed. And then I go over their hair analysis with them for an hour and a half, lecturing them on eating better food, eating more vegetables, cutting out sugar. And all they got from me yakking at them for an hour and a half was, so I can't drink my Diet Coke. I mean, that's a good start. Yes. Like, please don't drink Diet Coke, guys. But (laughs) I was like, that's it. That's all you got. And so they would take their results and they would take my advice and do nothing about it. So then I got to thinking, I'm like, okay. Maybe I am not giving them enough tools. Maybe it's way too much information and it's overwhelming. So people would come in, do a hair analysis. I would do my hour and a half of education, finding them answers. And then I gave them a menu plan and I gave them menus and a food diary and a to-do list and a shopping list even. And I was like, this is it. This is the holy grail. They cannot fail. And about one in 10 people actually implemented this. Now, this is a big deal because these menu planners that Janique made are incredible. They they literally give you these step-by-step. All you would have to do is pull out the paper and say, okay, step one says do this. I'm going to do this. Step two, do this. I'm going to do this. And by the time you've got through the list, you have successfully accomplished the most important part of a lifestyle change, which is the actual action. The only way we could make it better was if I came and moved in with you and did it for you. Like that is literally the only way it could be better. Which is why we were lucky because that's basically what happened for us when my mom moved in with us for a couple of weeks and And handheld us through through the process. So so the fact that just by giving people the steps, giving them all the information they needed wasn't enough for them to actually do it was perplexing and frustrating. So, So again, I'm laying up at night and I'm like, what is happening? Like, why are people not doing this? They're getting the answers. And then my aha moment hit me like a ton of bricks. It wasn't the food, you guys. It wasn't that they had to eat more vegetables. It was the emotional indoctrination about that food. In other words, our biggest problem as a society is not necessarily the food that we eat. It is our emotions that are attached to the things that we do. Exactly. We are emotionally addicted 
to bad choices. We're we're emotionally addicted to food, but then we're also chemically addicted to the food too. So it's the perfect storm. And so I realized I'm I I'm sitting here in my clinic, not just asking people to enjoy vegetables. I am asking them to completely rewrite their history with food, their emotional attachment to food, their memories, their holidays, the way they celebrate birthdays. I'm asking them to revamp their lifestyle from the bottom up and start over. So you're probably sitting here listening to me and being like, what on earth is she talking about? So let's kind of take you down your childhood journey path because that's where it starts you guys actually it starts before then did you know that a lot of baby formulas actually have high fructose corn syrup in them what why are we giving high fructose corn syrup to babies and formula you guys anyways let's fast forward to when you're a toddler okay you're watching a cartoon and then a commercial comes on and what is that commercial for if it's not a toy it's a sugary cereal or a candy bar or some new uh candy popsicle, whatever that Amer um, you guys, America makes so many candies. I can't even <laughs> tell you how much candy and like multiple aisles of cereal America has. And, and they're fun and they have bright colors and cartoon characters. Exactly. And it, it's like Disneyland in your mouth. Why wouldn't you want that? So there you are a little kid watching cartoons and then you see these fun, appealing, sweet foods and you want them. Okay. Now, not only that, but when you go to carnivals, when you go to Disneyland, when you go on vacation, how are we celebrating? With food, right? How about Easter? Mm. What do you think when you think Easter? Candy. Cadbury eggs, okay. right? Everybody's, John's shaking his head over here. John's our, our, um, our producer. Our audio guy. <laughs> yes, he's our audio guy. Um, what about Christmas? What are you guys thinking about at Christmas? Are you thinking about a massive plate of vegetables? No, you're, you're not. I'm looking at John well, here for his response. Candied yams are vegetables. So what, what are those? Candied yams. Yams that are... Oh, yams. Sorry. Y yams? Yeah, I'm sorry. Loaded with marshmallows. Marshmallows and sugar. I mean, when, when we're thinking holidays, we are not thinking the fun vegetable kinds of holidays. We're thinking the junk food, the stuff that is extremely stimulating and we love it. You guys, we don't care that it's bad for us because we are so in love and embedded and we have this codependence with it and we don't know how to break free because we don't even recognize it. We don't realize that we are these deeply embedded addicts, right? It's true. In fact, I think to a lot of my childhood memories and my favorite thing was Saturday morning. Why? Because I got cartoons and lucky charms or tricks, mm -hmm. right? It was the sugary cereal. I loved going to a particular friend's house because I knew that their mom was going to make me the most delicious and disgusting peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, right? Well, and let's now let's fast forward to our days and our experience with our son, you know, we're, we're trying to have our kids eat healthy food and they do when they're at a house. But what about when they go to school? They are rewarded with candy for reading, for being kind. When they go to karate, and I always bring this up, guys, they get candy for just showing up for karate. Mm -hmm. In fact, today when I registered, we were there registering um, Tennyson for school, Satori's throwing a tantrum. And what do one of the administrators do? Can, she, can we give her a snack? She a says, fruit a fruit snack. snack. She says, can I give her a fruit snack? And then I'm like, no, she's throwing a tantrum. Like, I'm not going to calm her down with sugar. Oh, and by but, the way. But this is completely normal, guys. And, and by the way, fruit snacks are not healthy, even if they're organic. They're not healthy. We'll get yeah. into that pretty soon here, actually. Yeah, we're going to talk about sugar and why sugar is literally a poison for your body. Like, And you're going to hear me uh, use sugar and poison interchangeably. And, and I'll explain to you towards the end why I am doing that. But so we're trying to appease children with sugar. We're rewarding them with sugar. So of course we are going to have this codependence with the most addicting substance on the planet. And you know what? The food marketers love it. Mm. They love it. And they're making so much money because high fructose corn syrup is cheap. And it does one, it does a very important thing. When you eat it, it does not suppress your hunger. So you eat more of it. 
It's so, brilliant. It's the perfect substance. So we just keep on eating it and we keep spending money on it. Mm -hmm. And it's like a bottomless pit. It is. Yeah. You can eat so much uh, high fructose corn syrup and you won't feel full. So you'll want more of it because it's also triggering all those pleasure receptors in your brain too. So you're like, oh my gosh, this is so fun. And I'm still not hungry. Like I'm still not full. So let me keep going. Okay. So sugar companies love it. And they're going to keep spending billions of dollars marketing it to you. And we are going to buy it because we are so emotionally attached to it, you guys. So when you marry the most addicting substance on the planet with the most emotionally and enjoyable moments of one's life, um, not only have you an, an addiction, but you have a codependence with your poison. You've, you've kind of created the perfect storm here mm -hmm. because not only does your body crave that sugar in the sense of it wants that immediate burst of energy, but emotionally you are longing for the positive reward that you get from eating those sugars, yep. especially because it reminds you of all your favorite things in your past. Exactly. Now I want to quickly brief, I want to just briefly touch on diet culture Whenever someone's like, I need to go on a diet, diets are short term, right? We, we think, okay, I only need to give up my pleasurable foods for a short amount of time to get my rock and butt and then I can go back to it, right? And it just doesn't work that way. Diets are short term gains, long term failure rates. So, so, so going back to my clinic setting, when people were coming to me and I'm like, you need a lifestyle change. People booked it out the door because I am appealing to their addiction and their emotions and decades worth of inner, what, what word am I? Intermeshment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do we do now? Okay. So that, well, first we need to talk about another demon in our closet. We, this is just unveiling the first demon. Okay. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about the second demon. Oh, wait, no. I'm going, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Sorry. Why do we need to care about this? Like, why do we need to, because a lot of people are probably now like, well, th this doesn't matter. Like we're all fine. Right. Are we? Are we, we are. Fine? We are so not fine. Come on. Why are we not fine, Tristan? We are sicker than we've ever been. We have more chronic disease at younger ages than we've ever had. Right. Our children are getting illnesses that used to be unheard of in children. Mm -hmm. And now it's actually commonplace. I know. It, it really is. Um, so, so if you're still unconvinced, then why should you care? Because we are setting our children up for failure. Like this lifestyle is killing them faster than it is killing us. And so... What do we mean by that? Tris, do you want to go over some of these statistics that we pulled up for people? Yeah, sure. So let's let's start with childhood allergies, shall we? Yes. Um, since 1997, childhood allergies have more than doubled. And peanut allergies in specific, tree nut allergies, have more than tripled. You guys, that's just 22 years. Like just In just over two decades, mm -hmm. we have created this huge allergy issue. That's That's weird. That To me, that's really weird. And it's super fast. To make it even worse, the percentage of children and adolescents, so basically all the way up through 18, 19, that are affected by obesity has more than tripled since the 70s. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone, though. We all know that, right. that the world as a whole, and America in particular, are getting more and more obesity. And it's a exactly. huge problem. But in our children in particular, it's becoming a problem. We're having children at the ages of like less than a year old getting diagnosed mm -hmm. with type two diabetes. Yeah. That's awful. That was unheard of back in like the fifties and sixties. Unheard of. But it gets even worse. Let's talk about cancer. Between 1975 and 1990, childhood cancers increased by 10%. Okay. That's, I mean, that seems like a lot for about 15 years, but between 1990 and 2011, it increased by an extra 14%, which means that over the course of about, what was that, 40 years, less than 40 years, we saw a 34% increase in childhood cancers. That's, and, that's a third. It is. And you guys, we can't blame this on genetics because only about 10% of cancers are genetic. And even cancer.org recognizes that the majority of cancers can be prevented by lifestyle changes. So I, there's something going on in our environment that's leading to this. That The good news, though, is that 
we can change our environment in order to change these outcomes. Absolutely. The problem is that the world is not going to help you do that. No. Because there's way too much money to be made in selling these products that make us sick, this sugar exactly. in particular. It's, it's this, cultural, um, this cultural issue that we are constantly headbutting over and over and over again. I even know like when we have um, dinners with friends or family and we don't feed Satori like ice cream because she didn't, she didn't eat her vegetables. And then people are like, oh, just give her a little bit. You know, it's like they don't, people... It's it's harmless. It's not like they're they're trying to um, to be mean, but it's just the culture, right? It's like no kids are sad. You give them sugar. You give them iPads. You give you you calm them down with addicting substances. And let the irony of that sink in for just a second. People actually feel bad for our children because we are not feeding them as much sugar. Right. As other people do. Like they're they're uncomfortable by that. They feel pity for our children because they are not getting bowls of ice cream. And isn't that wild? It's like, okay, so put it in this kind of context because you're like, well, yeah, children and ice cream equals norm normalcy, right? Okay, let's say your child is let's let's go back to when Satori was screaming at Tennyson School, right? Mm. Let's say that teacher said, Hey, can I offer her a cigarette? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, why, sure, why actually, I'm, that's fine. Like, <laughs> now everyone here is like, you don't give children cigarettes. That is carcinogenic. Like, that is so unhealthy for them. You guys, sugar is unhealthy. Sugar is literally a poison, and it is the most normalized po poison on the face of the planet. We glorify in it, we revel in it. Now, one of the differences is that we started to recognize the problems with cigarettes quite a while ago. Mm -hmm. And even then, it took decades before we got to a place where everybody pretty universally now says, yeah, these are terrible. We should do everything we can to stop them. Right. Sugar is a little bit behind because we've talked about this in the past. In the 1960s, they made a huge push to take the attention off of sugar mm -hmm. and focus it on fats. And so we spent a couple of decades, really three decades, probably focusing on the fat. wrong thing and just loading up on the sugar thinking ah, it's no big deal. So, so, so the food companies paid a ton of uh, research groups and universities to sway the research and show everyone that fat was the bad guy and sugar was fine. And so what happens when you take fat out of food? It tastes kind of gross. It tastes gross. So it's then, pretty bland. So then what do you put in the food to make it appealing? Sugar. Tons of it, okay? So now we're taking out the fat, which is really good for you, and we're loading it up with literal poison, and we're selling it on in shops and supermarkets as something edible. And I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, but guess what? A high sugar diet is a high fat diet. It is. And we're going to explain to you why in a little bit. We're going to kind of take you step by step. What happens in your liver when you ingest fructose? And it's really scary, guys. Like, you should be terrified, okay? But let's get back to where we were. So we've talked about all these terrible childhood diseases. We've talked about how, as a country, we are really not healthy no. at all. We can't blame genetics because this is not a genetic thing. And we've talked about how our environment, the way that our society is set up is mm -hmm. working against our ability to do anything yep. about this. And if you do something about it, you are potentially shamed for it. So before we give you any kind of hope, uh, we want to take you even deeper into the, the, rabbit hole. <laughs> the, the dark world of how your world is messed up. Let's talk right. about another addiction we have, which so is our addiction to doctors and medicine. Yes. Uh-oh. The infallibility of the medical system and the hero worship of doctors, you guys. Okay, so let's. So we're we're living our standard American diet, and we're getting sick, and we're suffering from autoimmune diseases. But that's okay because there's a doctor that's going to solve my problems and give me a magical pill, and all will be right in the world again. Okay, right before you shut off the podcast, quick disclaimer: we are not trying to make doctors out to be bad people. No. In fact, we think doctors are fantastic and they have a wonderful role to play. We're talking about the way that we use doctors and mm -hmm. the expectations we have from doctors that is unfair to them and ineffective for us. And yeah. that is, that's the evil that we're talking about here. Well, and doctors. sometimes doctors are just as much a victim of the system as everyone else. I mean, go back and listen to our, our episode with, with Dr. Dr. Sanders, Sanders. Mm -hmm. and Hear how doctors are so handcuffed 
to the insurance companies. They can't do their jobs properly because the insurance companies will not pay out if they do. So go and listen to that podcast. So we think doctors are just as much a victim as everyone else, but we put so much power on them. We, we give them so much authority. And, and like I said before, it's like hero worship. Mm -hmm. And we yep. don't recognize that these doctors are overworked and, and I don't want to say this, but they don't have time to care about your case. They don't have time to uncover every single rock and pebble and find where the dysfunction started in the first place. So what they do is they spend about two to 12 minutes on average with you. They get a list of your symptoms. They put it in a box and they match up prescriptions for that box. And if you remember or heard what Dr. Sanders said, he said that the insurance companies basically limit them to dealing with two issues at a time mm -hmm. and they can't charge for anything extra. So, so even if you come in with 15 issues, they're only going to be able to really go at about two right. of them. So, yep. and, and let's for a second, let's talk about what a doctor is, right? They, they spend all this time in medical school. They are full of knowledge, but what kind of knowledge is it? Knowledge on medications. They, they have learned basically a whole bunch of memorization, right? They've learned about all these different uh, diseases. They've learned about all these different symptoms. They've learned about all these different medications, and then they've learned to put them all together. So they see symptoms, they match it up to diseases, and then they match that up to medications in hopes of giving you the thing that's going to work for you. Exactly. They are not trained to get a long history from you and to critically think about your case and to work on all the preventive things that could prevent you from having mm -hmm. to go in in the first place. They're not, they're not trained to do all that. And then Johnny already talked about how they are limited in how much time they can spend with you as a patient. So we are expecting way too much from them and mm -hmm. we are also reaping the benefits of doing that, which is we get a whole bunch of medications that, treat symptoms mm -hmm. and not underlying issues yep. and it's not working. We're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Exactly. Um, now, now I know I keep saying hero worship of doctors and we put them on this pedestal, but we've also created a culture where you don't really question doctors. And there are a lot of doctors out there that don't like their patients questioning them. Mm -hmm. They will shame you for it. They will say, Oh, did you Google that? You know, don't, don't go to Dr. Google. You're not going to learn anything. That's dangerous. How many of you have heard Googling your symptoms is dangerous. Wait, self-empowerment is dangerous. Like why, why? And I know there's, there are issues with Googling your symptoms, but you are allowed to research your symptoms and your health. And you absolutely should. Yes. So, so, so not only do we have, not only do we give so much, um, authority to doctors, but they, they take it too. And they, they don't, a lot of doctors, not all of them, you guys, I can't like say these blanket statements and say every doctor falls under this umbrella, but a lot of them don't like to be questioned. They don't like to be interrogated. They don't, they, they want you to come to them and then they tell you what to do and you leave. And that is it. Okay. And and so, so we, so we need to recognize that doctors have a role to play, but it's not everything under the sun. Okay? So, so when you combine this method that they were trained to find symptoms and match them up with medications, and you combine it with the way that they're overworked and overstressed, especially in a hospital environment, and then mm -hmm. you combine that with this sense of, I know all the answers because we basically tell them they have to know all the answers. You have created another perfect storm here and mm. it is paying off in terrible ways because guess what the number three cause of death is in the United States, according to John Hopkins, by the way, which is a very important institution. It's iatrogenic causes, guys. What does that mean? <laughs> so it is a cause of death caused by doctors, hospitals, medications, surgeries, anything that has to do with the medical industry. So the number one cause of death is cancer. The number two cause of death is heart disease. And the number three cause of death are the medical establishments and everything that goes with it. Now, there's a lot that goes into that. We're not going to pretend that that entirely means that, oh my goodness, doctors are killing people left and right, right? Yeah. There, there are situations where 
they legitimately did the best they could right. and it just didn't work out. And that still gets counted as an iatrogenic death. Mm -hmm. That being said, far too many deaths occur because we are expecting too much from our doctors. We are not questioning what we're told and we're not doing any kind of research on our own no. in order to determine what else could be going on and what else we could be doing. We are relying on the magic pill mm -hmm. of the medical world and it is not actually that magical. But that magic pill is very appealing. It sure it's is. so it's so easy to just take a pill and have all of your problems go away. So um so we definitely have this issue. And let's let's talk a little bit about, about the medical system, shall we? First, I want you guys to recognize that the medical system is a business, okay? It's not a free service that we are given. It's definitely not free. Not, I mean, everyone's... Not here, not here in America, at least. No, not here in America. And and so we, we need to recognize that it's a business out to make money, and they just happen to provide medical services, okay? Mm -hmm. So so here are some... Do you want to go over the stats, babe? Yeah, let's talk about some more stats. We are full of stats today. so Because they're important. They the, are so important because they help us track the decay in our society and our health, you guys. Now, this one, this one really freaks me out because we're only measuring since 1997. For me, that feels like yesterday. Okay, I was born in 1982. I was 15 years old in 1997, so that doesn't seem that long ago. The Spice Girls were so hot in 97. I, I, bet, I bet a lot of people listening right <laughs> now I were remember. born by 1997. Right? I, ho I hope so, <laughs> Gosh, I don't know how old I am. But since 1997, prescription drug use has increased by 85% in the United States. 85%. We've almost doubled our prescription drug use mm -hmm. in just 22 years. Yeah. So we were spending $2.4 billion in 1997. Now we're spending $4.5 billion. That's a lot of money. 70% of Americans now are taking at least one prescription and 50% of Americans are taking at least two prescriptions. And I imagine there are some people out there that are taking dozens Way and dozens. Way more. Oh my gosh. We should have done like a, a like a quiz, like had people say, how many prescriptions are you taking? We and should. have them and, vote or something. And maybe we still can and yeah, we'll do we a follow-up on that. But I know that my little experience with the medical world with cancer, mm -hmm. I, how many prescriptions did they give me? I oh, must have had gosh. like 15 at one point. Not that I was you taking them. You sneezed and but, they gave you a prescription. Yeah, basically. It we was unbelievable. We have many, many bottles full of prescriptions that we need to get mm -hmm. rid of at our house Yep. back from those days. Okay, so not only are we taking more drugs and spending more money on them, and we're getting sicker, but um, it's also predicted that millennials will get diagnosed with colon cancer decades sooner than previous generations. It's already and we're seeing happening. that now. Like, Absolutely. Like, so colon cancer was considered an old person cancer back in the day. Like people in their, like you started screening for colon cancer in your 50s. And now people in their late 20s and early 30s and 40s are getting it. I mean, so this has been so ingrained. And in I remember they wouldn't even do a colonoscopy on you because you were, quote unquote, too young. Yeah, we had to ask several times. and we several. It took months before we, they would do a colonoscopy on you because there's no way something as bad as cancer could happen to a 33-year-old. We've got friends who demanded a colonoscopy for over a year before it was finally given. Mm -hmm. And same situation. By the time they found it, it was already stage three colon cancer. But doctors poo-pooed them. They said, it's in your mind. Manage your stress take, you know, do a colonic or take a stool softener and go on your merry way because you are way too young. And now this is why we teach self-empowerment because you know your body better than anyone. I mean, you're with your body 24 seven, seven days a week. You go and see your doctor once, maybe twice a year. You are the expert, not them. So if you're, if you're getting red flags, you need to insist on testing, insist on them checking into things. If they poo poo you, go bad somewhere news. else. Or find, yeah, go find, fire them. Find exactly. someone who will work with you and treat you like an equal partner, not as a a person to just do what they say. Exactly. Now, okay, so we've established that we are definitely sick in we're spite sicker. of the fact that we're taking more medication than ever before. Mm -hmm. And let's maybe talk about the cost of that. What yeah. the average American spends how much per month on on so, medical care? So the average American spends three $330. And then the average family of four spends 830 a month. And now I'm saying this because when people say organic is expensive, 
I want to remind you that health insurance is way more expensive than organic produce. Way more, you guys. Our disease, our, our diseases, our illnesses, they are costing us thousands of dollars. So, so it, so these magical pills that take everything away come with a very hefty price tag. In fact, uh, 20% of our GDP goes to our healthcare. So basically for every dollar that we make as a country, we're spending 20 cents on just healthcare. Which is crazy. And that's, and that's- we're getting sicker. You guys like investing in our <laughs> investing in something that makes us sicker. makes so, no sense. So we're spending more money than a lot of countries that are about as wealthy as us. Mm-hmm. We're getting worse results. Something is very wrong. We're spending a thousand dollars per person on prescription drugs. Mm-hmm. Now you're per probably year. you're probably out there thinking, well, I didn't spend anywhere near that much. Yes, you did because you paid insurance probably, mm-hmm. and that insurance in turn paid for somebody else's prescription drugs that cost probably up in the tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yep. So you are paying for this, whether you are personally using it or not. Yep. Um, but not only that, guys. Okay, so this is coming down to why the medical system is a business, like why they're out to make money. Okay, so $4 billion on was spent on drug marketing to consumers in, I think that was like 2013. And then $24 billion was spent marketing to doctors. But then, okay, so that's so much money trying to get, like hassling doctors to use your drug for your patients. Well, and and to be fair, maybe this is even worse. That marketing is usually under the guise of education. Right. So doctors go to these, they'll actually do full conferences that are paid for entirely by these drug companies. Mm-hmm. They wine them and dine them. And then, totally. and then they teach them, I'm doing air quotes since you can't see me, they teach them about their medications and how to use them, Yeah. which is basically the most effective form of marketing you can do. They are indoctrinating the doctors who yeah. then come back and start prescribing it like crazy. Mm-hmm. And it, I don't believe it happens anymore, but there's been issues in the past with doctors getting kickbacks for prescribing specific types of drugs to yeah, their they've, patients. They've really cracked down on that in the past few years. Thank heavens. But uh, that, that's, there's just so much shady stuff there. That system is perverse in that it's incentivizing all of the wrong types of behaviors. I'm kind of going off script here. You used to work in a clinic. Are you allowed to share your experience of what that relationship was like with the drug reps? So I used to work in a a pain clinic. I was doing psychology for them, um, working on kind of the mental health aspect of people's pain management. And twice a week, which actually is not that much. No, compared some to a lot clinics of places, get like every daily day. whining and dining. But but daily. twice a week, we had this sign up sheet where the drug reps could sign up to bring lunch to the office. And we would give them our request for what we wanted for lunch. They would bring it in. And as a reward for being so kind, they got some individual FaceTime with the doctors mm-hmm. where they could talk about whatever medication or drug they were representing. Exactly. And so, so no, there was not a direct kickback there, but heaven forbid that we say that it's totally above board. The, also, mm-hmm. um, just to interject, like these drug reps, they are not trained medical people. They are people with um, bachelor's degrees in, let's say, political science. Or more likely marketing. Or marketing. Exactly. That's what they are as marketers. So you have these not medical experts just talking to your doctor about a drug that the doctor needs to sell to you. These people don't know anything about health. All they know is your drug needs to be sold in this doctor's office. That's it. Now, we're not medical people either. And we do claim to know some stuff. So that's, you know, a little little bit different that way. However, these are marketers first and foremost, and their primary job is to learn enough about their medication that they can convince the doctors to start prescribing it. Mm -hmm. And they get really good at that. So they're not necessarily thinking about the larger implications of what they're telling these doctors. They're not saying, well, you know, you might want to be really careful about such and such a thing. And also make sure that they're also getting plenty of vegetables and sleeping well so that they can get off of this drug in a few months, right? Right. All they really care about is how can we get the maximum amount of drugs into the hands of the people so that we make lots and lots of money. Exactly. Okay, so where do we go from here? Uh, So we've talked about all the spending on drug marketing 
We know that we keep getting sicker. Now, one thing that those drugs do a really good job of is keeping us alive a little bit longer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We we are living longer, I think. Actually, we are. We no, are that's, living longer. that's changing. Our children are our children are predicted to not live as long oh, as us. Oh, that's right. So, um so things are starting to turn and around. We just However, recently read that too, huh? Yeah. So so the drugs are tending to help keep people alive, but what they are failing to do is give people quality of life. Exactly. Right? Like when when I was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer and they told me, "Well, there's probably nothing we can do." They did say, but if we put you on chemo for the rest of your life, we can probably extend it by a few months, Mm -hmm. right? Which which was going to cost probably millions of dollars in terms of the chemotherapy drugs and all the care and things like that. So, so they are great at that. They're terrible at helping you to actually feel good and accomplish your life goals and Mm -hmm. get off of the medical merry-go-round. Right. Okay. So Americans are getting sicker. Yet we're living longer with less quality of life. We're throwing all of our money at an industry and, and our health incomes are getting worse. And why is this? It's because we are not addressing that which needs to be addressed. We are band-aiding everything, you guys, because we don't want accountability to our health issues. We want the magic pill. We want, it, we want our problems taken away from us, basically. So we're addicted to the bad foods, the sugars, the bad habits, mm-hmm. like watching Netflix all day yep. instead of exercising and moving and going outside into nature. And then when we start to feel terrible, we don't want to take responsibility and make big changes and no. stop doing all of those bad habits. We just want a magic pill that can make us feel better. Exactly. And it isn't working for us. No. So we've got to think of something else that we can do. Exactly. Now, and the reason why it's not working for us, and I, I kind of want to go back to children, you guys. Like, we're, I'm seeing a lot of children in our clinic these days, children with chronic, not chronic illnesses, but they, they have a lot of health issues, like immune issues. You know, you're seeing, one, children are allergic to everything these days. And why is that? Because we're feeding them tons of junk food that feeds bad bacteria and we're not giving them wholesome veg. Like think of your children now, will they eat a vegetable tonight for dinner? Probably the majority of us are going to be like, uh, no, where's the mac and cheese, right? Like our children, our society, we are, we've forgotten. We have completely forgotten how to go back to eating wholesome foods. 50 years ago, that's all we did. That's all we ate were vegetables and healthy foods. And we have completely lost that art. Yes, Everything is processed. Everything is out of a package. And this is not okay. Like our children deserve better. They deserve to have a functioning immune system that allows them to process foods without having allergies to those foods. Okay. Because now they're allergic to everything under the sun, peanuts, wheat, dairy, soy, fruits, vegetables. It's ridiculous. So we need to fix this problem. So is this where we talk about sugar and kind of deconstruct it? All right, let's dive in. Oh my gosh. Okay, guys. So uh, why sugar? Like, so why, why do I have this issue with sugar? We all know sugar is more addicting than cocaine, right? Depending on how you look at it, yes. A lot of People out there would say, ah, I don't know about that. But. So so they did some rat studies and um, they had cocaine water and they had sugar water and the rats, uh, like most of the rats went to the sugar water over the cocaine water because it's, it, sugar literally acts as like a drug on your brain. So let's talk about how it acts on your body and your liver, okay? So let's say you, or let's say your child, your child drinks orange juice. Okay. And that orange juice is loaded with fructose. So did you know that your like insulin doesn't even recognize fructose? And, and that's really important because when it comes to diabetes, what people really care about is, mm-hmm. well, what is it on the, the, what do they call that? The, the glycemic index. Glycemic, thank you. The mm-hmm. glycemic index. Ah, well, if it's fruit, it's not very high, right? Right. So, okay. So you're taking in your, you're drinking orange juice. And it's, it's hitting your liver immediately because there's no fiber whatsoever, right? So we have all this fructose. It goes into your liver and it requires a ton of energy to be metabolized. So through a process of ATP going to ADP, um, we get this byproduct of something called uric acid. Mm. Now, Tristan, what does uric acid do in the body? 
So uric acid can create all kinds of problems in the body, but the one that people may recognize is called gout. gout. <laughs> exactly. And we, we like to blame protein on gout, but we don't mm. recognize that. This is actually from our sugar intake, you guys. So we have gout, but it also causes hypertension. It causes hypertension. Right? It causes edema. It, it, it can cause joint pain. I mean... The list goes on and on and on. Okay, so so we have this byproduct of uric acid, but we still have a ton of fructose now that our liver needs to process. So that turns in, so so the fructose gets converted, I think, into py, like pyruvate or something. It then enters the mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of the cells in the liver, goes through the Krebs cycle, creates energy in the liver, exits as citrate, okay? Now, when it exits as citrate, and we have a lot of citrate production from fructose, you guys. Um, when it exits as citrate, it turns into something called VLDL. Do you want to explain what that is? Very low density lipoprotein. So if you've ever had a lipid panel done where they looked at your cholesterol levels, they'll tell you, oh, there's good cholesterol, which is HDL. That's high density lipoprotein. Mm -hmm. And then there's LDL, low density, which is the bad cholesterol. Now, you could argue about whether or not that's really the case. But one thing that most people can agree on is that when you get into the very low density lipoprotein, the VLDL, that is not good. Across not. the board, that's just problematic. When you have lots of that, something is wrong exactly. in your system. So the VLDL is produced in your liver, causing fatty liver deposits. And then your liver can't hold and store all that fat. So what does it do? It pushes it out into the bloodstream for it to float around and stick somewhere else. And that is how we gain weight. Now... We realize that sugar, fructose, creates fat, but it also does something else. So we're going to back up a little bit. Before some of it converts to VLDL, it will trigger a, 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 an enzyme called JNK1, JNK1. And JNK1 is an inflammatory marker. It creates inflammation in the body. But not only that, it inhibits insulin production in your body. So we're eating all of this high fructose food. We're creating uric acid. We're creating fat. We're creating inflammation. And we're stopping the insulin from entering the liver and the cells to do their job. Yikes. So we have this like positive feedback loop with sugar. Okay. And none of it is good. Did any of that process sound positive? I don't think so, but maybe we can quickly summarize the bad parts here. So when you get the sugar, mm -hmm. fructose in particular, or yeah. just any sugar? The fructose in so particular. Fructose in particular, it causes an increase in that uric acid, which can lead to gout mm -hmm. and other issues. Yep. It also creates VLDL. Creates the VLDL, which mm -hmm. leads to heart disease, mm -hmm. basically. And, and other obesity. Issues, and obesity. And it gives you a fatty liver. Fatty liver and insulin resistance. And insulin resistance. So Which is diabetes massive. So diabetes, exactly. But you also forgot that the uric acid creates hypertension as oh, well. Oh, right. And the uric acid creates hypertension. So basically with just this, that one, just this one molecule, this fructose, we are killing ourselves in all of the worst ways. Exactly. Um, you guys, fructose cannot be metabolized by your muscle cells or anything. When you, in, when you ingest glucose... About 80% of that glucose goes to your cells and your muscles and can be used by your liver. It turns into glycogen and it goes to those glycogen stores and your body can call on glycogen, okay? That cannot happen with fructose. Fructose can only be metabolized by the liver. Hmm. Do we see the problem here? We're straining our liver. We're creating poison for our body. We're creating inflammation. We're inhibiting our body's ability to use insulin and use the other forms of sugar that could be in the blood. And we just have this cascade of events that are not happy events. Not only that, but fructose does not, um, does not switch on your ghrelin. Now, do you guys know what ghrelin is? Uh, what's ghrelin? Ghrelin is a hormone that, um, did I say it switches on ghrelin? It switches it does, off ghrelin. No, you said it does not switch on ghrelin. Okay, so ghrelin makes you hungry. When you eat, ghrelin switches off, okay? When you eat fructose, ghrelin stays on. So not only are you having, and I think I meant, did I mention this earlier? So, no, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I mentioned to you in the car. So mm -hmm. not only are you eating tons of fructose, 
but you're staying hungry. So what do you do? You eat more. You have more fructose. So we are able to poison ourselves more and be like, wait, I'm still hungry. Let me eat more. Let me tell you guys a story real fast. Because I grew up in South Africa where we ate tons of fresh fruits and vegetables. I remember moving to the United States and constantly eating yogurt here and being like, why am I so hungry? Why am I eating so much food? I don't understand this. Like I am eating twice as much as I used to. And then when I started learning these processes and when I started learning that fat was being taken out of food, fat inhibits your hunger. Mm-hmm. Okay. Fat makes you full. One of the reasons why the ketogenic diet is very effective at helping people lose weight. Exactly. So when they, when I learned that they were taking fat out of our food and pumping it with high fructose corn syrup, that light bulb switched on. And I was like, that's why, that's why I'm hungry all the time. That's why I want to eat all the food. You guys, do you see how we have this problem? And do you see how this beautiful cycle is so beneficial to marketers, but not to you? And this is particularly insidious because of the sources of fructose, right? Mm-hmm. It, it primarily it's in everything, and, everything, and it comes naturally in fruit. Mm-hmm. So people mistake it for well, if it's from fruit, it must be okay. So the fruit juices that are just loaded with mm-hmm. it, we think, oh well, it's from a fruit. That's fine. I'm going to give it to my kid in a treetop box, right? And right. they're going to drink it all day long. Yep. Or here's a big one. Back in like the 2005-ish, somewhere in that range, agave became very popular. Agave nectar, right? It was an alternative sweetener. And it was incredible because it didn't spike your blood sugar, Mm -hmm. at least on the glycemic index. Right. And so people started using it. Us included. People mm-hmm. started using it all the time they for drenched everything. drenched it on everything. And if you notice now, it's not that common. You don't see it everywhere the way that you used to. And it's because, I think, people started to realize what was really going on right. here. This we, process was happening in their livers. We were giving ourselves fatty liver disease mm-hmm. with this agave nectar. Yep. Exactly. And another insidious source of this fructose, honey. Mm-hmm. How many of you out there eat honey every day thinking, this is a health food. Look at me go. I'm eating healthy food because it's honey. Right. Is it though? So in small doses. Now, we need to recognize we can't we can't rid ourselves of fructose because like you said, it's in fruit, right? But fruit has fiber, but we'll go back to that. Mm. Um, it's It's all about the dosage, okay? Now, when clients come to us in our clinic and they're like, I eat fruit all day, every day. I'm like, oh my gosh. Like how many vegetables are you eating? You know, so small doses, guys. That's why I say don't become a fruitarian. You know, like please eat the vegetables because they don't have the sugars. They have the beautiful fibers and the vitamins and the minerals. So fruits have vitamins and minerals. Like they have good things and it like the fiber helps slow down the utilization of fructose in the liver versus it hitting the liver hard and fast and violently. Okay. It also feeds the bacteria in your gut, but that fiber holds onto some of those sugars to feed that bacteria. Mm. So when you're taking the fiber out and you're drinking juice, that's going straight into your bloodstream and hitting your liver. Okay. It's not making it to like the lower part of your digestive tract. Okay. And and so on that note, one more thing that we have to call out here, and that is the juicers. Sorry, juicers. If you are putting tons of fruit juice into your home Mm -hmm. juicing, maybe not all that healthy. You're creating this problem for your liver. You're stressing your liver. You're stressing all the systems in your body. You're creating inflammation. It's just not happy. Now, I want to talk about how we put fructose in everything because there's probably a lot of people that are like, oh, well, I don't drink sodas and fruit juices. Do you eat pretzels? Do you eat hot dogs? Do you eat chips? Wait, what do all these things have to do with fructose? They all have fructose in them. What? All of them. All of them? Yes. Like, okay, if you go to like a health food store, <laughs> there might be companies. You're, you're like totally jerking my chain right now. <laughs> well, I just happen to have some really amazing organic grass-fed hot dogs in the fridge at home. And you I, do? I know for a fact that they don't have any fructose. That well, is some yeah. high quality meat back there in the fridge. But But if you're going to like a carnival or something... You bet your bottom dollar those hot dogs have sugar in them because they are there's probably, so addicting. There's a better chance those hot dogs have sugar than that they have meat. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Real meat, right? Don't look up the ingredients in hot dogs, guys. That's not good. So we are putting fructose in everything. Um, go to McDonald's. Please, someone tell me 
What can you order at McDonald's that doesn't have sugar in it? Chicken nuggets. Th- that's actually true. <laughs> <laughs> I cheated. The chicken. Oh, you che- <laughs> I already knew. <laughs> but you're dipping the chicken nuggets in mustard and ketchup, which is basically high fructose corn syrup with color. Well, usually the dipping sauces you get with the chicken nuggets is mm-hmm. like sweet and sour or barbecue, and they all are just loaded it's with just sugar. Fr- yeah, so. high fructose corn syrup. Yeah. It's it's terrible for you. Mm-hmm. Um, if you Please don't eat at McDonald's, but if you do, uh, the fries don't have sugar. Chicken nuggets don't have sugar. It has other things that are problematic for we'll, you. We'll talk about the yeah. fries sometime. And the coffee and the tea. They don't have sugar, you guys. <laughs> So your <laughs> options at McDonald's are uh, either diabetes or cancer. So yeah, there you go. Pick. <laughs> so, so let's go back to square one. Let's let's go back to our first demon, you guys. Our culture has created the perfect storm for us to not only have a love affair with sugar, but to normalize it. It's totally okay. In fact, we expect you. To love it. We ostracize and criticize you if you don't. Mm -hmm. If you show up at a birthday party and you're not eating cake, you better believe Aunt Judy is looking at you and being like, but you don't need to diet. Why don't you just have a piece of cake? It's so wonderful, right? Dang it, Judy. So you guys, so we have this cultural problem. And then we think we have this magic pill that just really has way too many strings attached to it to call safe. And then we have this breakdown of what sugar is doing in your body. We are normalizing poison. Okay, cigarettes are not normalized anymore. They are frowned upon. Why are we not doing this with sugar? Because the best marketers in the world are telling us how we should eat, not science. And that is the problem. Huge problem. So how do we reverse this? Like, is there a way to fix our culture. I sure hope so. <laughs> I sure hope so. Otherwise we're wasting You're our time with this podcast okay. episode. Okay. okay. Let's, let's revert. Let's, let's rewind back to me in the clinic trying to help my clients. People are not implementing the changes. So what do I do? I stay up all night and I rack my brain on how to fix this problem. And you guys, I think I have gotten there. I think I fixed the problem because I have because people need a support network to to help them make these lifestyle changes. Um, you need people to help encourage you, and you need someone to coach you through it, right? Um, not only that, but learning about the problem, just like this, listening to this podcast and recognizing that there's a problem to begin with that you didn't even know existed. Having someone teach you these things, guide you through it, handhold you through it, and then teach you teach you to be the expert. Not only can you then start implementing changes in your life, but they will last forever. So I've created the Gutsy Health program. And what that does is it educates you, it coaches you, and it handholds you through your lifestyle changes. So what have we done, Tris? Tell them more. All right. So this program is at its core, it is a community And what I mean by that is we have tried to design everything around this idea of rebuilding your environment so that it is conducive to good health rather than fighting against good health. Exactly. So we have this online portal, basically, where you can log in. And it's very similar to Facebook, but without all the toxicity. Yeah. So there are posts, some of which we are putting up ourselves to help guide conversation and provide information and education but also posts where you as a group member can share your experiences, ask Ask your questions, questions, Mm -hmm. really just support each other in your efforts to change your life through better healthy habits. Exactly. But not only that, but from Monday through Sunday, we talk about a certain topic and it's just, we're talking like five to 15 minutes every day where we're we're kind of microdosing you on information that helps you feel empowered and helps you recognize that what you're doing right now is is the right thing for you. It just reminds you that yes, this might this change in your life might be hard. This reprogramming might be uncomfortable, but you're doing a great job and here is why. Let's look at the science. Let's look at the information. So Mondays we 
Mondays, like every day has a topic. Monday is Motivational Monday. Tuesday is Case Study Tuesday. And so Case Study Tuesday is actually my favorite because we share with you a case study on how someone was sick and how they got better through lifestyle changes, nutrition, food, and detoxification and purification and all that kind of stuff. So you're going to be learning from other people's experiences. Then Wednesday, we have Medicine Cabinet Wednesday where we're teaching you about herbs and supplements and essential oils. Basically, we want to teach you how to be the expert nurse in your family. Okay, You're not going to get a nursing degree, but I feel like you're going to get something way more valuable. <laughs> did I just say that? Oh, yes, <laughs> so, you did. Um, and then on Thursdays, um, people can submit their questions for um, for Friday, which is a live Q&A. So members of this group will be able to ask us questions and we will answer them um, for all of our members. And then Saturdays, people can share their success stories. And Sunday, we have Super Soul Sunday, where we talk about the spiritual aspect of healing and um it's a holistic healing, right? It's it's mind and body and soul. So we're taking care of the chemistry of the body, but there's also a massive mental slash spiritual aspect that we want to make sure you are addressing as you are embarking on this new chapter in your life. And that's my personal favorite because of my background in therapy and psychology. Mm -hmm. So I, I find that that one can be every bit as powerful as the education on nutrition and health and different activities you can do. So. Exactly. So not only that, so not only those little blips of information every week, but there are actually courses on certain topics. So we have courses on nutrition that you can listen to at your own pace. Um, so nutrition, drinking water, um, what are the other ones that we have? Well, Detoxification. It's, it's the Live Well series. It's is, the Live Well series. Is what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And it has, yeah, drink well, eat well, sleep well, stress well, supplement well. Mm -hmm. so, so we're going we're gonna to teach you to be an expert in all of these fields. Because how are you supposed to make educated decisions and choices that, that matter to you and your body's health when you don't know the questions to ask and when you don't know the information. So this online portal, this membership teaches you how to be the expert. It's what I was trying to do with clients in an hour and a half and I was getting nowhere. It's all the information that I wish everyone had walking into our clinic, their doctor's clinic, their pediatrician's clinic. Because when you are armed with information, you know how to advocate for yourself and your children. You know how to grill your doctor with the right types of questions to get you the best healthcare possible and available to you. And what's really cool about this is that it's like daily access to your personal health coach. Mm -hmm. It's as if Jeanne could come to your house every day for a few minutes, give you a pep talk, check exactly. in to see how you're doing, provide whatever information you might need for that day, mm -hmm. and then get you all pumped up and ready to tackle the challenges. Exactly. That's, I, we really, literally, the only way we could make this stronger is if we did move in with you. Exactly. But we don't need to because the internet exists. So we're coaching you every step along the way, every single day. We we are there and the group has access to us, to our knowledge, to um, our services. And, um, and the third aspect of that, because we've covered the knowing, right? The knowing, the education. Now there's the implementation part. And the implementation part is one of my favorite parts because you know you need to eat healthier, but what does that look like? Because as one of our clients said last week, she says, I have a bookshelf full of cookbooks and ask me how many times I've opened them. Not a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're overwhelmed. Like right now you could go on Google and Google healthy recipes and they are overwhelming because you're like, does it taste good? Is it really good for me? And so what have we done? We have created a meal plan weekly menu for all of our members from Monday through to Saturday. And um, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> we actually have our daughter in the recording studio and she's making a mess right now. And I'm just like dying inside. That was my mom part coming out. So we have these meal plans that um, that you don't even, all the decision fatigue is gone 
We are designing these meals for you. We know that they work. We know that they're healthy for you. All you need to do is implement them. Do the step-by-step process, meal prep. And what we, what I normally tell people is get the whole family involved. So do your grocery shopping on the weekend and I give you the grocery list and I kind of give you a pep talk every Friday about the meal plan that's coming for the next week. And then you go grocery shopping and then you do all the food prep on Saturday and a Sunday. And then you have these yummy healthy meals for you for the rest of the week. And most importantly, you have people checking in to make mm-hmm. sure that you're following through and not coming up with excuses to put it off for another day. Exactly. So you're getting the community, you're getting the coaching, you're getting the education, you're getting the step-by-step guides. It's it's complete. This is a comprehensive program. Exactly. Because we it took us a year and a half to finally realize that answers are not enough implementation is. So finding answers is the easy part. It's doing it that is the hard part. And the Gutsy Health Program has been designed to be so easy in in a, in a world where it's the most unintuitive thing in the world, right? That is correct. So, um, so if you want more information on our Gutsy Health Program, if you are in a situation where you are sick and tired of being sick and tired, but yet you're paralyzed, you have no idea where to turn. You don't know what's right for you. You don't know what's, what's wrong for you. What diet is the perfect diet for you? If you need help, if you need someone to help advocate for you on a healing journey, reach out to us. Go to www.mygutsyhealth.org. Com. Learn about the program. Reach out to us. We are passionate. We are so passionate about people getting real answers and real healing. We, we're we tired of seeing people on that medical merry-go-round over and over and over, spending sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars when all of that was unnecessary and they're getting injured by medications and hopelessness. So if you are in a space where you're like, I'm ready, I need a lifestyle change, I need to heal my body, I deserve a healthier lifestyle free of pains and aches and brain fog and low energy, then maybe the Gutsy Health Program is a good fit for you. So one more time, that is mygutsyhealth.com. Exactly. So you guys, hopefully you learned something new today. Hopefully you were able to recognize the demons that exist in our society that are kind of dolled up with pretty dresses and makeup. And really they're ugly and toxic for you. Um, I hope this information makes you not feel hopeless, but empowered because, um, because that's what we're about. We're about empowerment. Hopefully you are fired up. We are fired up talking about this because yes, it enrages us, but it also gives us so much excitement for what is possible. Exactly. We can do so much good by really tackling this problem head on first for ourselves and Mm -hmm. then for each other. Exactly. Also, I don't think there is any other. Have you ever come across a program like ours that incorporates the coaching and the food and um, like and education? it's all online? And I all, I don't know. No. I haven't looked a whole lot out there. So, but you, this is pretty unique. And it's really honestly, unique, you guys. The price is pretty good too. We don't we don't charge a ton. No, so. like p- people that want to join our pilot group for six months, it's forty. It's thirty nine bucks. Thirty nine bucks a month. Yeah. So that's less than a bottle of water a day. It is so affordable. Uh, most people are like, what, is this going to cost me thousands of dollars? No, we want it to be affordable so that you're not stressing out about that because you have enough stuff to stress out about as well. So invest in yourself, invest in your future, invest in your children's future and help heal your bodies and your children's bodies because you guys deserve it. You deserve to know that there are things in our world today that are harming us with pretty faces on. And you need to recognize that those are the demons that we need to tackle head on to help us heal. Thanks, guys. See you later. 